Hey everyone, welcome to Bridgepoint Online this week. Whether you are watching live or later on demand, we are so glad that you have chosen to spend this time with us today. Coming up, we'll be wrapping up our series on the book of 1 Corinthians with a message from Tyler that will encourage you to place your hope in Jesus no matter what you may be going through. Before we get started though, I just want to remind you about our ongoing generosity drive. By now, you've probably heard us mention it, but I just wanted to reinforce that even if you aren't able to be at a physical campus, you can still take part and be a blessing during this upcoming Christmas season. Here are a few ways that you can pray about being involved. Firstly, you can donate monetarily Anything designated to local missions during the drive will be put towards purchasing food and toys for local families in need. And anything given to global missions will be used to purchase items for Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes. You can give on online or in the Bridgepoint app. Just look for the giving link in the main navigation. Additionally, if you prefer, you can shop our Amazon list and have the item delivered directly to the Tyrone campus or pack a shoebox online. Details for all of this are on the Generosity Drive page of our website. You'll find that linked from the weekly update page. Speaking of the weekly update page, if you're new to Bridgepoint, you'll hear us mention this page a lot. All the information you need to know about events or initiatives that we mention will always be found on the weekly update. So if you've not downloaded the Bridgepoint app yet, why not take a second to do that now so you can stay up to date? Okay, that's gonna be it from me today as we're about to get started. If you're watching live, please say hi in the chat. We love knowing who is joining us online each week. If you're watching later on demand, we would love you to leave a comment on the video. Say hi, let us know if this is your first time watching or if you're a regular. So have a great day, everyone. Enjoy the service and God bless. Good morning, Bridgepoint Church. Would you stand and worship with us this morning?
fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand oh let me hear your voices against the power of our How are we doing this morning? We good? All right. You sound alive like you got some caffeine in you this morning. Want to welcome you. Glad you're with us. Whether you're joining us online or here in the room at our Tyrone campus, glad you are with us this morning. We truly believe that God is doing something really cool in and through Bridgepoint Church. And uh, we just want you to participate. We want to invite you to not only join us here on Sunday mornings, but to continue on getting connected, serving, and finding ways to follow as we go where God is leading us. A really cool season coming up. Gabe's going to share some of the stuff that's going on. Yeah, so you've seen it on your way in over the last couple of weeks, but our generosity drive is still happening. Um, and so whether you want to participate in our Operation Christmas Child, there's shoeboxes in the atrium, whether it's the Thanksgiving food drive, the toy drive, it's housed under that one name of generosity drive. And that actually comes to a close, the cl uh, collections for that next Sunday. So you still have time, uh, bring in those food items, bring in those shoe boxes, participate in the generosity drive. And the reason it's coming to a close next Sunday is because the holiday season is is approaching. All right, ready or not, it is here. Christmas season is upon us. Lights are going up. The commercials are happening, um, but Bridgepoint is also doing a lot of cool things during this holiday season and Christmas season. So if you're interested on finding out more about the Christmas Eve service times here at Bridgepoint, Blue Christmas, Advent devotionals, all those different things, download our app um, so that you can be in the know. Check out our weekly update. Check out our website for all the things that you need to know on this Christmas season and how you can participate alongside us as a church. Are you guys ready for Christmas? I thought y'all were gonna get like kind of loud. I'm kind of liking the fact that we're not racing ahead, getting too far in front of Thanksgiving or too far behind it. But yeah, everything about Christmas at Bridgepoint is found on the website, on our app. If you don't have the app, download it, put it on your phone. That's where you can find all the information about what's going on, times, details, logistics, everything for Bridgepoint Church. So get the app and make sure you're doing that. Hey friends, everything that we do, whether it's generosity drive, Christmas, or everything, every ministry opportunity in between, all of it goes toward our mission, is about our mission. Everything we do is about helping people get closer to God. And that's a mission that we wanna invite you to join us on, to participate in, but it's one that doesn't uh, happen, it doesn't occur without your generosity. So if you've come today prepared to make a tithe, a contribution, a gift, thank you. It goes toward our mission of helping people get closer to God. There are ways to give on campus, here in the room, also online, on the website, on the app, you can find ways to give. That we just want you to follow uh, us and as we follow where God is leading and want you to participate and join us along the way because God's up, up something really cool. Hey friends, as we continue in this time of worship, take a minute, turn to somebody around you, introduce yourself, greet one another as we continue in worship.
So we're going to step back into a time of worship together. And so the hope is that um, you allow this opportunity and this time to be a moment where you um, maybe just take a breath, maybe just take a moment to um, settle in into what we're about to step into again. Uh, the God that we worship is uh, not a God, just a figment of our imagination. It's not just something we created to make ourselves feel good when we lay our heads at night. Uh, truly, this God that we choose to worship, we truly believe has delivered us from death into life has delivered us and freed us from the shame of sin, the shackles of sin. And so uh, this God that we worship truly means everything, everything about what we do here is not in vain. And that's good news because that means what you're enduring and what you're experiencing and going through in your life, God is not absent from. He's there with you. He's alongside you, caring for you and sees you. And worship is our opportunity to give unto him what he is worthy of, which is our praise and worship. So church, we're glad that you're here. Settle on in and let's choose to worship in this time together. Amen.
like never before your presence your presence is an open door so come now Lord like never
Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that the words of these, so of these songs ring true. And it's your nature, God. And we can sing about who you are because that never changes. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing in this life, we can rejoice. We can worship you because of who you are. And you will always be the same the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And we praise you and we ask for your presence. We thank you for your presence that's here with us this morning, Jesus. We ask that you would just continue to move, continue to speak. Touch our hearts this morning, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right, Bridgepoint Church for the church family downtown, the church family in Seminole, the church family online, and of course the church family here in Tyrone. How are we doing this morning? You guys feeling good? Yeah, man, I don't know if I got a, a hold of a good cup of coffee this morning. I'm excited to wrap this series up, but man, I'm fired up for today. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're tuning in. If it's your first time or first time in a long time, welcome to what God is doing in our house. It is a privilege to be a part of how he's at work, and, and I trust that today will be an encouragement to you. Here's why. We are wrapping up our series we've called 1 Corinthians, a letter to them, a word for us. Some of you are probably cheering that we're just wrapping up a series, but it's been really good. Uh, so much so that we've had unexpected feedback of folks saying, man, I didn't know how much I needed this series until today. So whether you go to Bridgepoint's YouTube or through the app, you can catch up with us. This is the idea that as we've taken a broad walk through what we call the book of 1 Corinthians in the Bible, it was Paul's letter that he wrote to a church in Corinth a couple thousand years ago. Uh, they were, it was an early church, uh, people trying to follow Jesus, figure out what that looked like. It was not like a manual on how to do church. They were figuring it out. And Paul was helping to lead them, giving them some wisdom and advice. We're wrapping up our study today in chapter 15. Paul had one more. It wasn't a, he didn't write the chapters in. We added those later. But 1 Corinthians has one more chapter, chapter 16. Uh, chapter 16 is where Paul's kind of giving his shout outs to early followers to let everybody know what everybody in different series are up to. And then Paul encourages everyone in the Corinthian church to greet each other with a holy kiss, all right? So turn to your neighbor really quickly, and I'm kidding, I'm kidding, all right? Don't, please don't panic. We had some of the dudes in BP youth and young adults that were like, this is my moment. Give me a heads up, pastor. I would have sat next to her next time. No, this is actually, that's a really helpful reminder that not everything you read in scripture is principle you practice in modern day. Some of it just informs our context of its past, okay? And so not, we're, we're not doing the holy kiss thing. You are safe, never gonna happen. Don't panic, don't check out on me. This is not, if you experience a holy kiss, let someone know, call the police. Uh, this is, that's not what we're aiming at, okay? Don't, do not panic about that. Uh, like I said, we're gonna live in chapter 15. Chapter 15 today, man, as Paul's beginning to wrap up his letter, he brings a haymaker to the Corinthian church of good news. Like it was just a word to them that ties it all together. In fact, I would encourage some of you to hear today's message, read what Paul wrote, and then go back through and reread 1 Corinthians because what Paul, what we're reading that Paul wrote today, this is the glue, it's, it's the anchor point. It's almost a jumping off place that holds everything that he's written and taught up until now together. 
It's the, it's the meat. Like this is the point. This is why you read everything else. This is why we practice it. This is why we aim for it. This is why we try to live into it. This is why all of it matters. It's that good. Now, let me also say this before I jump into it. The past couple messages, and, and this has been a fun series, the past couple messages that I've been able to do, and even the ones before that, Travis led one, and then Travis interviewed Brad. Great stuff. Great, great stuff. Those messages, a lot of them kind of bent more towards folks that are church people, like those of you that would say, I am a Jesus follower. And what I think is beautiful about our family, our church family known as Bridgepoint, is that many folks in the room on every campus are online right now. Some of you would say, I don't, I don't know that I'd say that I'm all in like that yet. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I would even consider myself a follower of Jesus. Uh, this is a message that I think is gonna, this is for you, all right? If you're in the room, if you're tuning, on, tuning in and you're wrestling with a lot of doubt, like just like, I, I don't know how to believe this stuff. If you feel like you have more skepticism than confidence, today's gonna be really good news. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time and you feel like faith's kind of hanging by a thread for you of just like, man, how, how God so good yet life can be so broken? are so painful. This Today's gonna be so good for you. So whether you've been following Jesus for a long, long time, you're not quite there yet, or you're somewhere in between, this is your moment. Please lean in with me. These are not my words. These are not my, this is not my ideas. I wanna take you back to the setting of, of just de decades, decades, so maybe even less than that after Jesus's death and resurrection and what it meant for those people and how Paul used that truth to culminate his, his book, what we call the letter of, to the first Corinthians. It is powerful. So much so, I'd kind of begin with this just to, to, to sort of bring us all together with this big question. Don't answer it out loud, but how, how would you answer this question? How can you know that any of this is real? How can you know that any of this is real, right? This is a faith thing. We walk by faith and we, our faith is, will be made uh, known one day. We'll see it. But we walk by faith, not by sight. So how do you know? How do you know? How do you know when things don't turn out the way that you want them to? How do you know it's real when God seems a little bit silent? How do you know it's real when he didn't answer the prayer the way you wanted him to? How do you know it's real when life gets really tough? When the marriage is on the brink, the bank account is nearer, closer to zero than anything else. How do you know any of this is real? I want you to bring your doubts. I want you to bring your questions. I want you to bring your skepticism today and hold them near and dear as we walk through what Paul said. Because answering this question, me to you guys, through what Paul wrote to this early church, that's where I want to go today. And I think it has potential to be that impactful for each and every one of you. Remember, Paul wrote a letter to them. But what we've been discovering in this series is, man, it's a word. For us, it matters. Even 2,000 years later, it matters. How? How do you know this is real? How do you know it matters? That's what I want to process with you today. I'm, I am fired up, if you can't tell. So let's jump into it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to start in verse 1. If you've got your Bibles or your Bible app, you can turn there or just follow along with me. What Paul said here, I think, is just that important. He's beginning to wrap up his letter here, and he says this. He said, now I would remind you, I would remind you, brothers, talking to the whole church, brothers and sisters, I would remind you before we go past this, Paul's referencing back to something that they already knew. And I think some of us need the reminder that remembering in, when it comes to faith is so critical because I would argue the reason many of us often struggle with things of faith is we don't remember how God has been good to us in the past. We get caught up in the busyness. We get caught up in the grind. We get caught up in the loops that it becomes so easy to forget. And Paul's speaking right into that. Now, guys, I would remind you, brothers, calling to mind of the gospel I preach to you. 
Now, as a side note, maybe you've grown up in church, maybe you're new to it, maybe you've heard this word before, maybe you haven't. What Paul says here, the gospel, Paul, it was literally translated, Paul saying, I wanna remind you of good news. Like their faith, walking with Jesus, understanding him as Lord and Savior, King of the world and Lord of our lives, that's intended to be good news. And I wanna pause there. I'm not trying to unnecessarily delay but is following Jesus good news in your life? Because if it's not, you may not be following the real Jesus. You may not have the whole story because the story of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection and what it means for each and, uh, each and every one of us, whether we've got there yet in our faith journey or not, it's good news Paul said, I'm here to remind you of the gospel I've taught you. I've preached it to you. And everybody's like, that's the good news. He's reminding us of good news. If it's not good news today, I need you to lean in with me. Be here, right here in this moment. Because what Paul's got, what Paul's got, it's that good. Paul said, guys, I'm reminding you of the gospel I preach to you, which you've received, and maybe you're not there yet, but he was writing to a church that already had. You've received in which you stand, like it's what keeps you going, it's what keeps you upright, it's what keeps you anchored, and by which you are being saved. It's the power that does transformative work in us. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, now, Paul's saying, listen, I can't read your heart. I can't see into your heart. I can't know it. God does. You do. So this is a journey that's between you and God. And unless you're just kind of going through the motions, then Paul is saying, remember the good news that anchors every ounce of your life. Remember the good news that you can stand in and stay standing in. Remember the good news that's rescuing you from sin and brokenness that exists in me and exists in you. It existed in the Corinthian church at the time. Remember all of that because that's the power of God at work in us. Paul's saying, remember the gospel. And then Paul said this. He said, for I delivered to you as of first importance. You guys were the priority. You got the priority message of this good news. He delivered what I also received. Like, I'm not just telling you a story. I'm telling you what I experienced. And here it is, that Christ, he's talking about Jesus, that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. In other words, you know this. This wasn't something made up. This is just what's been passed around in word and letter and the gospels that we know. He died for our sins. It's what the prophets told us was gonna happen before Jesus ever took his first, first breath. It was all there. It's all true. Jesus died for our sins. You know, can I pause here for just a minute to make sure this connects all the way into your heart? You are not too far gone. You are not too far broken. You are not too far messed up or down in a pit that God's eyes and offer are not upon you with good news of rescue from sin. Just like it's told in the word of God, the Bible. Paul's saying, remember, this is what I told you and it's what I've experienced, that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, like it killed him. It's not a question. This isn't even at this point, this wasn't the feel good part of the story. He took the weight of my sin and yours, the sins of the Corinthians. Jesus, the sinless savior and son of God came to live the life we couldn't. Because while we were dead in sins, God was busy loving us to make a rescue plan that allows our dead hearts to discover new life. But that death was taken upon Jesus. He put it upon himself. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might be right with God. We might receive his righteousness. Understand that. That God looked at your life and loved you enough to send his only son to die in your place and mine. You are so deeply loved by God. That sin, 
my sin and yours. It killed Jesus. He died, his heart stopped. No more air was going into his lungs. And these Roman centurions that were there to ensure his death, they were masters at execution. They knew it had killed him. They pulled him down, not questioning it, not thinking, well, he might still be hanging on. They were like, that guy is dead. So he can be taken off the cross and you can dispose, discard of his body. He was buried, placed in a tomb that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus looked on your broken life and mine, your sin stains and mine, and responded with love. Love to come and take my sin and yours upon him to the point where it killed him. They placed him in a tomb. And just because Jesus had gone around saying, hey, here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna die and three days later, I'll rise again. Just because everybody thought that's not normal, let's make sure there's no funny business. They rolled a giant rock to cover his tomb that not just one man could, could roll. Because they were like, we can't afford any misunderstandings. That dead man must be treated and must remain dead. They put a giant stone in front of his tomb in accordance with the scriptures. This is what Jesus has been telling. This is what the prophet said was coming. That's what happened until three days later. That dead heart started to beat again. Three days later, later, those airless lungs started to fill again. And three days later, the son of God that died in my place and yours rose from the grave. And though there was a stone to keep people out, there was a stone there that could not keep the only person in. And he walked out of that tomb alive and well and still king of the universe. Now listen, that's what's true about Jesus. And Paul was saying, guys, remember, remember, because that's good news. How is it good news though? And maybe more importantly, how on earth is this event, this historical event that happened 2,000 years ago, how is that good news for us today? And here's what Paul would say to this, because he wasn't finished reminding them said, you guys remember this. He lived and loved, he died and was buried, and he rose from the grave just like it was promised to us. And then Paul wrote this, and that he, that's Jesus. You remember this, he's reminding you that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. Then Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, you guys know people that had a conversation with Jesus after he walked out of the grave. This isn't a feel-good story. This is something that happened and changed everything because some of them in the Corinthian church, Paul was saying, remember who Jesus talked with after he rose? You guys know some of them. And in the moments you start saying, man, is this real? Does any of this matter? He's like, go find somebody and ask them. Some of them had died. Some of them are no longer with us now. But some of them are still alive and kicking and some of them haven't been the same since Paul was walking around saying, remember, we're not here writing a new religion. The Bible, Jesus didn't come saying, hey, take notes on this. I'm trying to start a brand new philosophy of religion. Jesus wasn't interested in a new religion at all. Jesus was interested in the new avenue of relationship that he was opening the door of that you and I might know God. And this entire thing is based upon the truth that there were people that interacted with Jesus when he rose from the grave. Y'all, that's not normal. That's not a normal thing. But Jesus said, here's the game plan. I'm gonna die and then I'll rise again. And everybody's like, right, right, right. But he kept his receipts and then he did it. And then there were people that were able to touch the scars in his hands. There were people that shared a meal with him after all of this went down. There were people that were suddenly looking into the face of the Savior 
There were people, Paul says, and then, then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles and last of all, as to one ultimately born, he appeared also to me, Paul said. Paul encountered this guy. Paul, Paul hated Jesus' followers. He hated the ways and teachings of Jesus. In fact, he was bent on murdering and eliminating people that were following Jesus until he met him. And then everything changed. If you're skeptical, if you're doubting, if you've got questions, if your faith is hanging by a thread, hang on right now because this is really good news. But I want you to know that I'm glad that you keep pressing forward because our God is not afraid of your doubts. He's not afraid of your skepticism. He's not afraid when faith feels like it's hanging by a thread because our God's big enough for that. He's strong enough to handle that and he gets you and understands you. Actually, Paul was ready for that too. I wanna jump down a few verses and tell you exactly what Paul said. And for some of you, this might be a breath of fresh air, fresh air to hear right here in church because here's what Paul wrote. Paul said, if in Christ, he's writing to the Corinthian church, but it'd be the same for us. If in Jesus we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. You see that? This is your permission to bring your skepticism because Paul is saying, if all of this is just a fairy tale, if there weren't eyewitnesses, if Jesus isn't, wasn't, didn't rise from the grave, if he didn't die in our place, then they're right. People should look at us in modern times and think those poor Christians investing themselves in a feel-good story that means nothing for life now or life to come. They get a little bit of hope and that's it. They invest themselves, their time, their talents and treasures into these churches. And if all of it's not true, if it's not true, then we should be felt bad for. Moreover, put me as the poster child of pitiable people because I've given my life to serve this as a job. Pitiful Tyler. Wasted his good looks <laughs> to just be a pastor. Guys, if it's not true, oh man, what a waste all of this is. But if it is true, but if it is true, it changes everything. If it is true that a dead man walked out from the grave and suddenly that which has always been final is no longer the final parts of our story, it changes everything. If a dead man can rise, then a period is no longer a period. It's just a comma. And his invitation to us is to find new life in him. Then it means there's not a broken or dead space in my heart or yours that is at its ending point. Because if Jesus really is alive and you are still alive, then it means Jesus is not yet done with you or me. It means that there's hope for today and hope for all of our tomorrows. It means that if he's alive, then our dead places could be made alive too. If, it, if he's alive, then it means the punishment and inevitable weight that we would incur because of our sin, death that we are due, it means that death no longer rules over us. So the addiction doesn't get the last word. The chains that we feel don't get the last word. The way we feel tangled up, stuck, broken, cast aside, or beat down, sometimes unlovable, marginalized, or unseen by God, it means that none of those things are true. Because if Jesus defeated sin and death, then sin and death will no longer defeat us. Because he's alive. He's alive. Now listen, I'm not writing back to something that's just a feel-good story. I'm writing back and referencing the evidence of a historical event that changes everything. In fact, that's my point for you today. For the doubter, the skeptic, those of you just hanging on or those of you that just needed some fresh wind in your faith, let me give you this big idea. The pivotal event of our faith is the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Maybe you've heard the lyrics to that old song, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. We're not anchoring our faith in our ability to believe it enough. We're not anchoring our faith in our ability to try harder. We're not anchoring our faith in our ability to mean it when we say, never again, I'm not going back to that bottle, to that screen, to that type of relationship. We're anchoring our faith into a God who experienced death, but death wasn't strong enough to hold him down. And if that's true, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I can face today, I can face that next hour, I can face what's coming tonight, and I can face all the Monday mornings. I can face every week, I can face every month, I can face every year, not because of my own strength, but because Jesus rose and invites me into his new life. The sting, the permanence, the finality, the darkness, the loss that always accompanied death is no longer because Jesus put death to death because now life reigns for any of us that make Jesus the Lord of our lives. But let me be really, really cautious about how I say what I say next because I wanna be abundantly clear. The resurrection of Jesus is not, it's not a guarantee that you or I will have all the answers to this life. We still live in a broken, sin-stained world. And there's still sin in me that Jesus and I are working to root out of me, much like your own faith journey. It's not that I'll have all the answers. The resurrection of Jesus is not a promise that God will answer every prayer the way that I want him to. The resurrection of Jesus is not, it's not a genie in a bottle journey. The resurrection of Jesus is not going to bring full explanation to every one of my pains and yours, this side of heaven. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Sometimes it just seems that unfair. Sometimes the pain is just that painful. The resurrection of Jesus does not bring clarity of why to every circumstance on earth. One day we'll see him face to face and maybe then things will make a little more sense. But here and now, it's not clarity. The resurrection of Jesus does not mean there won't be more tears this side of heaven because we still have to navigate life in this broken world because sin still has consequences even if the ultimate consequence is erased because of the blood shed by Jesus. Life is still broken. But listen, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. In other words, just because I won't have all the answers, his life and resurrection means that I have enough purpose to keep going. And just because God won't answer every prayer, I can trust that he's good even when life is not. Just because it won't explain every pain, I can take comfort in knowing that Jesus, that his spirit is present with me in every pain and will see and tend to every tear I cry. Just because the resurrection doesn't bring clarity of why, the resurrection brings a hope in my faith that though I won't and may not ever understand it now, I can keep pressing forward because the God that understands it all still holds my world in his hands. And just because the resurrection doesn't mean there won't be any more tears this side of heaven, I can still experience a and pursue a peace and joy in the midst of chaos and hurt that exists all around me. The resurrection is not a magic eraser of the pains and hurts in this life. The resurrection is the pivotal event that we anchor our faith into because Jesus is alive and because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And the only way I will inevitably lose in this life is if I stop holding to his new life and the new life he offers to me. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. 
Now listen, some folks on our pastoral team was really hammering me because this is such a clunky big idea. It's really two in one. And so let me explain myself. Some of you in the season of skepticism that you are in, some of you need to decide what you will do with the resurrection of Jesus. His death and resurrection is a historically recorded event. You can go to the tomb that once held his body and peek in there and it remains empty to this day. Some of you need to begin your journey there. It's the pivotal event of our faith. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus. If that happened, it changes everything and it happened. So what are you gonna do with it? But some of you, Some of you need the the opportunity to be reminded of why we hold tightly to that resurrection. And that's because of that song lyric, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Two big ideas, one same point, but all that we believe and all that we anchor to. The reason we hold on believing that we walk by faith and not sight, that this is real even though we can't see it, is that it really did happen and there really were people that saw the risen Jesus. And if that's true, it changes everything about the potential of my story and yours. What are you gonna do with the resurrection of Jesus? And those of you that have been following Jesus, that have trusted him as your savior, that are walking through hard times, dark times, tough times, painful times, or any of the times, we hold so tightly that because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Paul began to wrap up this section of his letter. He put it this way, and I'll wrap up with this. This quote from R.C. Sproul is an American pastor. He said, the resurrection was God the Father's way of authenticating all of the truths that were declared by Jesus. It's yes and amen when you and I claim God's promises. And Paul put it this way. He said, the sting of death is sin. That's why death is so painful. And the power of sin is the law that none of us can measure up, all of us have sinned, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in light of that, he said, therefore my beloved brothers, beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, we hold tightly to Jesus because he lives I can face tomorrow. And so come the mountaintops or the valley low, our journey, my journey is not a period until the God of the universe and the king of my heart says, welcome home, good and faithful servant. And that's the invitation to you too. That though we are, stained, broken, wrecked, and on a pathway towards sin and destruction in our lives. The invitation of Jesus was to step in, live the life we couldn't, die the death we deserved. It killed him. My place and your place killed him. His dead body was placed in a tomb until death and darkness could not contain the power of God and he rose. And his invitation to you, maybe for the first time in a long time, maybe for the first time ever, is to experience new life in him simply by believing that you and I are sinful, but you probably didn't need me to tell you that, right? The Bible says it's all of us, but we know that by believing that this historical event was real and it was real to you and it was real to me, that Jesus' death and resurrection was enough to pay my sin debt so that when God looks at me and looks at you, follower of Jesus, he doesn't see our sin-stained lives. He sees us through the lens of the blood of his son. And simply by saying, Jesus, because of that, I want to follow you now and forever as imperfectly as that will be, as the king of my life and the king of my heart and the savior of it all. 
we experience new life now and forever until the end of this life when we stand before him face to face. That's what's at stake. Go back and read through 1 Corinthians now, Paul's journey. It was a letter to them, but my goodness, a word from us. What are you gonna do with the death and resurrection of Jesus? How do you know any of this is real? It's because he lives that I can face tomorrow. Would you pray with me? God, I I love that you, your spirit inspired Paul to write such a powerful chapter in that letter to the Corinthian church. But my God, how much it means for us today. God, would the truth that you sent your son, that he died and rose from the grave, would it be such a resounding statement for all of us today that it stirs something deep inside? God, that's not my power or my words. God, what if that's evidence that your spirit is alive and well today? Some of us need to make some decisions about what we do with that pivotal event. But God, some of us today need the reminder that because you live, we can face tomorrow. And God, would your spirit be at work in all of our campuses, in all of our spaces, and in all of our hearts to cause us to hold tightly to what's true. And what's true is that we pray to our risen King. Thank you, Jesus, that you're alive. And thank you, Jesus, that you offer us new life. And it's in your mighty, powerful, risen name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Friends, the gospel, the good news of Jesus has been proclaimed. It's been presented. The invitation has even been extended to each and every one of us. So I don't want to try and take us back up, take the plane back off and try and convince or retell or reshare what's already been presented so clearly. Instead, I want to give us this space, this time to simply respond. Tyler asked several times, what do we do with the resurrection? What do we do with the gospel, with the good news? And I believe it is a message, it is an act, it is a life, it is a person in Jesus that demands a response. And so maybe you're here today and you've never responded to the good news and the gospel message of of Jesus. His mercy, his grace, his love presented and offered to you. If you've never received that, embrace that. And you're feeling like God is stirring that in your heart today. Friends, there's no better day or time than right now, than the present. And we have a place called uh, Prayer and Care with people who are uh, there to listen, to talk with you, to pray with you, and to help you make that next step if that's the decision that you're wanting to make today. Out, outside the back doors, turn right, you'll see signs. Online, you can click a button. Friends, just want to encourage us to respond. And so for those of us in the room, this time I want to invite you to to stand. And as we stand, as we continue this time of worship to really rest in this space, maybe not so quick to walk out the doors and head on to lunch, but what if we stayed in this spot reflecting on the good news, what it means, and what is offered to us by a God who is good, a God who is trustworthy, a God who is faithful, and a God who promises new life and eternal life in and through Jesus Christ. Friends, I believe that is a message worth praising and worshiping God. Amen? Let's do that.
steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me yeah. God for me stay God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, yeah. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do, you're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my That's all we have for you guys today. So we just want you to know we love you. We're here for you. Uh, like Travis said, if you guys would like to pray with anybody, uh, we're in this thing together. So uh, our prayer and care is out the doors to the right. Online, click a button. But other than that, love y'all. Have a good week. We'll see you next week.